Most malware today hides critical code or data. And one of the fastest ways to uncover what's really happening is with a debugger. But without a clear process, you can easily find yourself stepping through code without knowing what actually matters. My name is Anuj Soni, and after more than a decade reverse engineering malware and teaching thousands of analysts how to do it effectively, I'm gonna show you how to reveal and extract a hidden Windows executable with the help of a debugger. So here on my desktop within my Windows 11 virtual environment, I have a file called explorer.exe. And by the way, if you want access to my instructions to get your own Windows 11 malware analysis VM set up, check out the link in the description. So one of the first steps I often take in my analysis workflow is to drop the sample into a tool called Detect It Easy, which I have here on my desktop, in order to get some basic information about the file. So let me go here and drag explorer.exe over to the Detect It Easy desktop shortcut that I have. Right away, I can see that this is a 64-bit Windows executable, and it's likely written in C. Detected Easy can also identify whether a file is packed or obfuscated using known packers based on signatures. But in this case, nothing obvious is detected, because if it did, you would see it here among this blank area under the existing text. Now, another thing I like to look at early on is the file's entropy, which is a measure of randomness. The more random the byte distribution is, either across the whole file or within specific sections, the more likely it is that some data has been obfuscated. If I go ahead and click on Advanced here on the top right, I'll see many additional features that Detected Easy provides. One option there is Entropy, which is located right here. And if I go ahead and click on it, it opens up a larger screen here. Let me go ahead and maximize this. Now there's a lot on this screen, but I wanna focus on the Entropy tab, which is right here, and includes all of this information. This shows the entropy values for the individual sections that make up this executable. Now, each section has an entropy value listed between zero and eight, where lower values indicate more structured data and higher values indicate more randomness. So under the status column, Detected Easy makes a best guess at which sections might be packed or obfuscated. And in this case, you can see that there's only one section, the dot data section that is labeled as packed. Now, if I wanna take a closer look at the .data section, I can go over here to the left-hand side and click Sections, and then I can click on the .data section here at the top. On the bottom, you'll see a hex dump of that particular section. And as I scroll down, you'll start to see some patterns, but as I scroll past those initial patterns, you'll see that it is largely made up of random data. And taking a look on the right-hand side at the ASCII representation of the bytes on the left-hand side, you can see that there's not a whole lot of readable content here. And the data does look relatively random. This is a good indication that there might be some obfuscated content here. So the next question is, what is it? When you see obfuscated data embedded in a suspicious program like this, or at least what I'm telling you is a suspicious program, it usually means that the data will be decoded during execution. That makes sense because the malware has to reveal the real code or data in order to actually use it. And that's where a debugger becomes useful. Because if this content is revealed at runtime, we can use a debugger to pause execution and inspect the real code or data in memory. Now, my debugger of choice for this kind of work is x64 debug. And if I go to the desktop here, let me go ahead and close down Detect Easy. You'll see two shortcuts here called x32 debug or x64 debug. Both of these are associated with the x64 debug debugging tool set. It's just that the x32 debug version is for debugging 32-bit executables, while x64 debug is for 64-bit executables but the capability, the tool in general, is referred to as x64 debug. Since we already saw using Detected Easy that explore.exe is a 64-bit program, we're gonna go ahead and use x64 debug. Before we dive in, a quick note. Believe it or not, around 80% of the people who watch my videos aren't subscribed. So if you have found my content helpful in any way, subscribing is a small step that goes a long way in supporting my work and helping me put out more videos like this one. But back to the task at hand here, I'm gonna go drag and drop explore.exe to x64 debug here on my desktop. And this loads the program into memory the same way Windows would if it was about to run it. 
but execution is paused at the entry point. The entry point, by the way, is the first instruction within the program that the CPU will execute. You can see in the bottom left here that x64 debug shows that we are paused. The instruction highlighted in gray represents the next instruction to execute. And over in the rightmost column, you can see that x64 debug has identified this as the entry point. Now there's a lot on this screen to absorb, but before we touch on anything else, I wanna point out one important configuration setting, especially if you are following along, which I do hope you do at some point. I'm gonna go here to the menu and click on options and then preferences. And here under the events tab, I want you to make sure that only the entry breakpoint checkbox is actively checked. If you have any others that are checked, go ahead and uncheck them. And if this one is not checked, go ahead and check it. So your screen, your configuration should look exactly like what I have here on my screen. And when it does, you can go ahead and click save. Then from the menu bar, I want you to choose debug followed by restart, which is gonna go ahead and restart the program. And if you didn't see her here on the top right earlier that it says address of entry point, you should now see that text. Now, coming into this video, you may or may not have had much experience with assembly, but here on the left-hand side, what we're looking at is x64 assembly code. But even without a deep background in assembly for now, you can still appreciate the value of debugging, and that's really the main goal of this video. So let me quickly walk through the layout and the key areas that we will be using here today. On the left-hand side, you'll see hexadecimal values that represent virtual addresses, basically locations in memory. At those addresses are opcodes. These are the hexadecimal values you see to the right of those addresses. And these hex values correspond to the instructions you see on the right of those. And these are the instructions the CPU executes to actually carry out the program's logic. On the right-hand side of those instructions, there's a column with auto-generated comments that can provide helpful context. And again, the highlighted instruction in gray is where execution is currently paused. In the top right here, we have the registers window. Registers are small, fast storage locations used by the CPU. Their size matches the architecture of the program. So since we're looking at a 64-bit executable, the registers are 64-bit wide. Watching registers can give you insight into what's happening during execution, since instructions constantly read from and write to these registers. When a register value turns red, like any of these right here, that means it recently changed. Now we won't dive into every register today, but I do wanna call out one in particular, and that is RAX. This register often holds the return value of a function, and that will become useful later on. In the middle right, this window shows the function arguments, which are values passed to a function to help it achieve its intended goal. While we don't have time to get into details of all relevant instructions, one instruction I do wanna mention is the call instruction. And you can see an example of some of those here on the screen. A call instruction does exactly what it sounds like. It calls a function. When execution reaches a call, the arguments being passed to that function are displayed here on the right in order. One being the first argument, two being the second argument, and so on. On the bottom right is the stack, which is a structure in memory used to store function arguments, variables, and other important information related to execution. And finally, on the bottom left, we have several dump tabs. These let us inspect memory at specific addresses. When you're debugging, you're often trying to understand what a function does by looking at its inputs and its outputs. Those inputs or outputs are frequently pointers or addresses of locations in memory, and these dump windows allow us to inspect what's actually stored at those locations. All right, now let's shift our focus to the main goal for this video, which is identifying and observing any deobfuscation that happens while this sample executes. There are a lot of different ways you could approach this, but I'm gonna show you one method that works well and doesn't require you to understand every instruction or register that you see here on my screen. So understand that when malware deobfuscates code or data at runtime, it usually needs somewhere to put that decoded content. That often means allocating memory. On Windows, there are many ways to do this. But one very common Windows API for memory allocation is called virtual alloc. As the name suggests, virtual alloc allocates memory. The documentation describes the arguments passed into the function as well as the return value. 
What's important for us is that the return value of virtualloc is the starting address of the newly allocated memory region. So the question becomes, how do we tell if this program actually calls virtualloc during execution? To answer that, we're going to set what's called a breakpoint. A breakpoint tells the debugger to let the program run until a specific point and then pause execution when that point is reached. In this case, we want to pause execution whenever virtualloc is called. So down here at the bottom in what's called the command input field, I'm going to type BP for breakpoint, followed by the API I want to set the breakpoint on, which of course in this case is virtualloc. I'll then go ahead and hit enter on my keyboard. And now you can see confirmation that a breakpoint has in fact been set. Right now, remember, we're still paused at the program's entry point. So let's run the program and see what happens. I'm gonna go now to the menu at the top under debug, and I'll choose run to continue executing the program. Once I run it, you can see that execution now has paused as indicated on the bottom left. And if we take a look at where we are paused, we'll see references to virtualloc, which is located within kernel32.dll. Let's take a moment to look at the arguments being passed to this function. We can see those over on the right-hand side, right down here, as I had mentioned earlier. Now, I'm not gonna walk through every parameter here, but I do wanna draw your attention to the fourth one, which contains a value of hexadecimal four zero. If I return to the Microsoft documentation, you'll see this fourth parameter is called flprotect, and it specifies the memory permissions applied to the newly allocated region. The documentation says this parameter is used to specify a memory protection constant. If I click on that and find the value I'm seeing in the debugger, which again is hex 40, we can see that it corresponds to page execute read write, the keyword here being execute. That combination is often a strong indication that executable content may be written to this memory region. Next, what we care about is the return value. Since virtualloc returns the starting address of the allocated region, once this function returns, that address will be stored in the RAX register. So I'm going to let virtualloc return by going back to the debug menu here and choosing execute till return. I'll now click this. You'll see we've continued running and we now are paused at a return instruction, which is commonly the last instruction at the end of a function. Now, if we look at RAX, which again is over here on the right-hand side, we can see that it is red because it recently changed. This address, FC0000, that is stored within the RAX register is the starting address of the newly allocated memory region. Let's now take a look at that address and dump it into one of the dump windows that we talked about earlier. In order to do that, I'm gonna click over here. I'll specifically right click. I'll then choose follow in dump to basically follow that address stored in RAX in one of the dump windows. And you'll see here on the bottom left, we are now in dump number one. And the address right here, FC0000, corresponds with the same address that we saw in RAX, which means this is the area in memory that we are now currently looking at. Now, at this point, there's nothing interesting here, which is actually expected. By default, virtualloc returns zeroed out memory, so the allocation itself doesn't tell us what's going to be written there yet. So this is where we take the next step. What I wanna do now is set a hardware breakpoint at the beginning of this region in memory. A hardware breakpoint is more persistent than the breakpoint we set earlier on virtualloc, and setting a hardware breakpoint is particularly helpful when you're dealing with deobfuscation. So what I'm gonna do now is right click on this first byte in the dump number one window. I'll then go in the context menu to breakpoint, and I'll choose hardware access, which will tell the debugger to pause whenever this byte in this memory region is accessed, whether it's being read from or written to, and I will go ahead and choose byte. This should allow us to catch the exact moment that this memory starts being used. Now I'll go ahead and resume execution by going to debug, and then once again, I'll choose run. You can see that the debugger pauses again. In the bottom left, it shows that execution is paused and references the hardware breakpoint that we just set. So just to recap, we found memory that was allocated with execute permissions. We set a hardware breakpoint on it, and now we're watching for when real executable content shows up there. 
Now, at first glance, nothing has changed, right? We still see zeros in the dump window, but pausing at this hardware breakpoint means the code is starting to interact with this area in memory. If we look around, you'll see something interesting that might stand out, depending upon your prior experience, and that is multiple references to the character's PE. You may or may not already know this, but these are the literal characters that appear in the header of a Windows executable, and they are a hint that deobfuscated executable content may be present in memory. So how do we explore this further? Let's go ahead and inspect the memory region that contains the character's PE and take a closer look. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click on this instruction that actually references PE here in the comments. I'll then right click, I'll go to follow in dump, and I will choose the value RSP plus 30 because here in the comments, that is what's being referenced associated with PE. So again, I'll right click here, I'll go to follow and dump, I'll then choose value RSP plus 30, and I'll click. Now in the dump window, we're looking at a different address, and at that address, we can see the bytes 5045, which corresponds to the character's PE, as shown here in the comments, and as also shown here in the ASCII representation of those bytes. If I go ahead and scroll up a little bit, I can also see a reference to the familiar, this program cannot be run in DOS mode, which typically appears near the beginning of a Windows executable. And if I continue scrolling up before that, I'll see a reference to the MZ bytes that again, are typically the starting bytes of a Windows executable. So this is a strong indicator that we have found a Windows EXE in memory. From here, the next step is to dump this executable to disk for further analysis. In order to do that, I'm really just gonna right click anywhere in this memory region, and I'll go to follow in memory map. This takes me to the memory map, which shows the different memory regions associated with the process. The highlighted region here in gray right now is the one that contains the executable bytes that we just identified. So from here, I'm gonna right click on this highlighted row again, and I'm going to choose dump memory to file. I'm going to keep the existing default file name here, but I am going to choose to dump this to the desktop, and then I'll go ahead and click save. I'll now go to my desktop, and here is that dumped content. And if I wanna take a quick look at it, what I can do is drag and drop it into HXD, which is a hex editor. And right away, I can see the MZ bytes right here, followed by that this program cannot be run in DOS mode. Now you can see that we do have some extra bytes here before the MZ header actually begins. And that's very common when dumping content directly from memory. So to clean this up, all I'm gonna do here is just highlight these bytes before the MZ and then hit backspace on my keyboard and then confirm that I want to go ahead and delete those. And now I have MZ at the beginning of the file, which is what you would expect for a valid Windows executable. I'll then go ahead and save this close HXD, and then I can proceed to do some static analysis using a tool like PE Studio for a closer look. So I'm gonna now drag and drop this to PE Studio, which I have also here on my desktop. PE Studio will take a bit of time to process it typically, but what I can see here rather immediately is that it is a dynamic link library or a DLL, and it is a 64-bit executable. It also has a single exported function here that is called reflective loader, which is characteristic of a cobalt strike beacon, which is the payload that provides command and control capability to the attacker. And that's as far as we'll take this analysis today. Just to recap, we used the debugger to identify memory allocation, catch the moment the real payload was revealed at runtime and extract it without reversing the entire loader. If you wanna extend this workflow to DLLs, I've included a link to an earlier video of mine covering that topic in the description. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.